Hello and welcome to Justice. I'm Judge Janine Pirro. Thanks for being with us tonight. The GOP candidates are back at it, many of them in Iowa right now at the Faith and Freedom Coalition's annual gathering. Governor Mike Huckabee is one of those candidates and will join me live in just a few minutes. But first, let's take a look at some of the highlights from the campaign trail today so far. I brought my Bible. See? I'm better than you thought. You're going to have a tough choice to make. You need to make the choice on who you can trust to go to Washington, D.C. and fight for all of the issues. I'm a good fighter. I will tell you that. I'm a good fighter. And I win. I really win a lot. And we will win. Defense is not knee-jerk. It's not red lines. It's not just tearing up agreements because it gets you a round of applause. It's being able to manage and being able to maneuver and put the best interests of the United States first. I am prepared with your support, with your prayers, with your votes to lead the resurgence of this great nation because leadership is what is required now. So let us think about what a leader must do in the White House. The single greatest national security threat facing America is the threat of a nuclear Iran. You know, about a month ago, I observed if this deal goes through, the Obama administration will become quite literally the leading financier of radical Islamic terrorism in the world. Now, in response to that, President Obama got very upset. He said, what Cruz said is ridiculous. You can't say that. You cannot use that rhetoric. Well, let me give you a very, very simple principle. Truth is not rhetoric. When I get in, if I get in, you will be very, very proud of me. We will be respected, believe me, and that deal will become much, much better. I know you have a lot of people who say we're going to rip it up, but they don't understand the way it works. But I am going to take that deal. I do that. I buy contracts that are bad, where people have lost a fortune with a bad contract. I take the contract and I scrutinize the contract. I make it so brutal and I do good. America has been played as chumps sometimes. And there comes a point at which we have to say, America has always done not only its part, but many, many times over. But it will not become the repository for every person who comes here, many of whom without the best intentions to love this country, to live in this country, to assimilate in this country, and to accept the kind of life and freedom that we hold dear. And Republican presidential candidate Governor Mike Huckabee joins me live from Iowa. Good evening, Governor. Judge, it is great to talk to you. It's been a while. Thank you for having me on. Oh, it's great to have you on, Governor. All right, let's talk about Iowa. In 2008, you won the Iowa caucuses with 34% of the vote. But right now, your Iowa numbers are at 4%. Why do you think that is? Well, I think that right now a lot of people in Iowa are doing what Iowans do at this time of the, uh, the game. Do. They're shopping. That's pretty uh, normal for uh, the process. And, and typically, Judge, whoever has the summer blockbuster in the summer does not win the Oscar in the spring. So right now we're doing what one does to win Iowa. We're building organization and structure, and we're visiting all the counties. And that's what we'll continue to do up to the caucuses. And I still believe we're going to win the caucuses come February. And there, there's no question that you, more than any other candidate, uh, have had more visits in Iowa than anyone else. Well, we have been here more. I've been to South Carolina more than any of the other candidates because I know that ultimately that's what wins elections. Uh, it's not just uh, media attention, although we'd love to have it. And it's not uh, even rallies. It, it, at this point, is organization. And it's also building connections with individual voters who will start really looking at uh, who they're going to vote for very seriously once it gets close to time. And we're a long way from that process. All right. Let's talk about the debate the other night. You were uh, you, you were upset about the fact that you got nine minutes in a three hour debate. You know, it almost seemed as though the person who yells the most and jumped in the most and kept saying, Jake, Jake, Jake. Uh, uh, got in there to say what he or she wanted to say. What were the rules? Well, obviously there weren't many at all because uh, <laughs> we went in expecting that there was going to be some, uh, at least 
vague attempt to have an equal allocation of time. Equality doesn't mean everybody will have exactly the same uh, number of minutes. But look, there are 11 of us on the stage. It's hard to get us all in. I get that. But my gosh, we had three hours and 20 minutes. I was on the stage almost 45 minutes before I first got the question. I think part of it was, Judge, I said from the beginning that I'm not going to get on the stage and play ping pong with nasty statements with other Republicans on that stage. You know, there's a part of me, I'm sitting there, I'm in the Reagan Library. I'm standing in front of, of Air Force One that he flew all over the world in. Ronald Reagan's mandate to Republicans was that we treat each other with respect. We don't eat each other alive. And I thought, how inappropriate uh, to be goaded into this food fight with other Republicans. Because, ju Judge, let me tell you something. Every person on that stage, I know they're my rivals, but I have respect for every single one of them. And any one of those people on the stage, I believe, would be an improvement in the presidency to the occupant of the White House we have now. And so I'm not going to spend my time disparaging them. I, I'm going to try to tell people why I ought to be the quarterback of the team, not break the legs of the other people trying out for the job. But, you know, Governor, it seems that the person who is doing the most criticizing is the one at the head of the pack and that maybe there is, you know, some reason to do that to get to the head of the pack. Uh, it, it could be, and, and I'm going to have to just uh, wait and see how this plays out. But I can't be anybody than who I am, and it is not my nature uh, to go and try to stick my fist in the face of somebody else and to uh, elbow my uh, way through the nostrils of other people. Uh, I'm going to be assertive. Uh, I had to take some assertive action the other night to get any attention. Uh, but ultimately, I, I think people want to know, do you have the temperament to be president, which means that uh, there's a little bit of, of a sense of perspective. And it's not all about me. It can't be. It needs to be all about the issues that American people are facing. And I just wish we could have talked about more of them, like the infrastructure of the country, like Social Security and Medicare. Judge, there were so many things that never, ever came up in three hours and 20 minutes. I find that uh, distressing. Did you think that there was an agenda by CNN to try to get the, you guys and, and the woman on the stage to go after each other just so that you could trash each other and, and basically bring everyone down on that stage? Was there an agenda? Well, it, it seemed to be. In fact, they said before the debate that their goal was not so much just to ask questions around the horn, but to get the candidates to engage with each other. Now, if you want to engage each other on substantive issues, but it was more about, hey, Mr. Trump, Carly said something about you. Would you like to react? Oh, Carly, yeah. Uh, yeah. would you like to react to what Mr. Trump said? That's third grade stuff. We're running for president, not class president of the third grade. Well, well, there's no question that's what seemed to have happened. But, you know, you talk about who you are. Let's talk about who you are. I mean, you were a pastor for many years, and now we've got uh, uh, the Pope who is coming to the United States. He's, uh, you know, he's got some very progressive views uh, and, and, you know, on issues that are may not be consistent with yours. You believe in banning abortions. He's talking about this year of mercy and forgiving abortions. Uh, he wants to talk about income inequality and climate change and going before Congress. What do you make of all this, Governor? Look, he's the leader of the Catholic Church. I'm not Catholic, but I have great respect uh, for Pope Francis. Uh, I was a huge fan of Pope John Paul II, thought he uh, remains to this day one of the greatest spiritual leaders in the history of Christendom. Uh, but look, Pope Francis has not taken the church on a different position. He still believes abortion is wrong, but he believes, as I do, that even people who have abortions can absolutely be forgiven. That's what God's grace is all about. So I'm not on a different page there with the Pope. I do think that the president uh, has been amazing in trying to bring people to the audience of the Pope in the White House. It, it almost appears uh, to, to just force the Pope to face people uh, who have a very different moral perspective. And I, I don't know why the president would do that. It, it seems that the Vatican is beginning to push back on that, as they should. Uh, the purpose is not to embarrass the pope or to confront him. Uh, it ought to be to welcome him as the spiritual leader of millions of Catholics in America and across the world. Well, but, but, Governor, what do you think about the fact that he wants to speak and he thinks one of the most important issues today is climate change? And you've said that, you know, there isn't necessarily any scientific data to support it. Uh, but, but, but why would the pope be talking about that and income inequality as opposed to canon law, the doctrine of the church? 
Well, I, I think that there is a, a very important place for the Pope to address income inequality as long as he doesn't believe that the answer is that government redistribute wealth. Right. Uh, if we really want to fix income inequality, the best way to do it is to help people have decent jobs that pay good money, uh, make sure that you have an economy that doesn't punish people for working, which is what we have now. There are definitely some ways that we can help with the uh, issue of income inequality, but the worst thing we could do is this uh, socialistic idea of taking money from some and then just redistributing it. Uh, so caring for the poor, you bet that's a subject that the Pope should talk about. Uh, climate change, look, the Pope is entitled to the views that he wants to have. He's the Pope. He doesn't need counsel or advice from me. And I think, frankly, we ought to hear him, listen to him. And uh, if we agree with him, well, let's applaud him. If we don't, then we still show him respect. Of course. Because he is the elected head of the Catholic Church. And I respect that. All right. Let, let's move along, Governor. What we've got are now, right now, tens of thousands of, of migrants crossing uh, into Croatia today. Croatia uh, setting up and closing borders with wire fences. Hungary pushing back. Well, I mean, uh, what would a President Huckabee do about these migrants? I mean, what, what do we do about them? Well, one thing we do, we need to begin insisting that the Arab countries whose culture and language in which they would be most comfortable uh, begin to accept a responsibility but for how do helping we do to house that? them. Governor, how do we do that? Uh, you know, whether we can force it or not, uh, I, I think we make it very clear to the Saudis and to others in the Middle East, look, we have uh, made you rich by purchasing your energy, but we're not going to take all the problems of your region of the world, largely created because of the mismanagement of uh, the whole issue of radical Islam, and we're not going to accept the responsibility for bringing people into a culture where they will not be comfortable with a language that they do not understand and cannot communicate in. Uh, this makes no sense. All the Saudis have been willing to do so far is to build 200 mosques for people in another country, not even in their own. And that's unacceptable. And I think it's, uh, it's high time the United States not be played uh, as chumps. And oh. sometimes we just allow ourselves to be played as chumps. And in, in that regard, what about our southern border? Are we chumps? It's got to be secured. We are chumps. You bet we are. We're chumps not only on the fact that we've not secured our border, which we should do in less than a year. We built a road between British Columbia and Alaska 73 years ago that was 1,700 miles long, and we built it in less than a year. Judge, we can get the border secured if we have a president with the will to do it. But we also have to address the fact that nearly half of all the people here illegally came legally and overstayed their visas. Right. And that has to be one of our highest priorities as well. All right. Governor Mike Huckabee, so good to see you. Thanks for being with us this evening. Great to be with you, Judge. Thank you.